Dun, 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 dun. Nodal analysis. Nodal analysis is sort of a universal technique we can use to solve multi-source circuits, current sources, voltage sources, whether they're independent or dependent sources. Works wonderful. It relies on Kirchhoff's current law, basically summations at nodes. It gives us, when we're all done, a set of node voltages for the entire circuit. So that's a really convenient output, having all of your node voltages. Once you know all of those node voltages, you can find any component voltage or any branch current that you would be interested in. So let's just dive right in here. We'll start with a little voltage source over here. We'll call this ES for source. It's associated with an impedance, complex impedance of um, an inductor. We'll call this JXL1 and a resistor R1. This will then come down through a second inductor. All right, we'll call that JXL2. Another resistor, R2. Third resistor, R3, and finally we have a capacitor over here, minus J, X sub C, which feeds into a current source, an AC current source, right? And we'll just call that I sub S. Now the first thing we have to do is identify the nodes in this circuit. So the nodes are basically connection points where currents can split or combine. So this point right here, this point right here, although the components connect there, those are not what we would call nodes as far as nodal analysis is concerned. Right? I want to see a place where the currents could possibly split. So we have one right here, which we'll call node A. We have one right here, node B. And then of course we have a reference node. In other words, this node voltage is with respect to the ground. So there's three nodes in here. Now we only um, have to write equations, if you will, for two of them. So if you have n nodes, there will be n minus one equations, basically, right? So you have three total nodes, you subtract out the reference node, and that leaves us with two sets of equations, all right? So this is going to require a simultaneous equation solution. You can solve that in your preferred method. So the first thing to do here is to define the individual currents in and out of the various nodes. You can choose a direction that's convenient for you, whatever looks comfortable. Um, it really won't matter, as you'll see, the signs will all work out correctly. So I'm just going to say, right here we have a current number one. Uh, we'll say the current down uh, through this inductor, current number two. Uh, through this resistor up here, current number three and then down through this other resistor will be current number four. Of course, the current through the capacitor is this IS current, all right? So now we're going to use Kirchhoff's current law to write a summation, a current summation at each of these nodes, right? So we start off with node A. What do I see for node A? Well, coming in is I1, and then exiting we see I2, and I3, all right? Now, what is I1, right? I don't know that off the top of my head, right? We know the values of the voltage source, the current source, the resistors, inductors, capacitors, things like that. Those are the component values that we know. Um, the individual currents don't know those, but I can write them in terms of some things that we do know, which would be things like ES and R1 and so forth. So I1, is written in terms of its Ohm's law equivalent. What's the voltage across that pair of components and then divided by that impedance, right? So the voltage across that is essentially ES minus VA. All right, now that's divided by R1 plus J XL1. Now you might ask, why is it ES minus VA instead of VA minus Yes. Well, that's solely because of the direction that we chose for I1, right? We're flowing from high to low, essentially. So we're going to assume, because we're taking this current from left to right, um, ES minus VA would give us this polarity, right? Plus to minus. That's our assumption. 
if I had assumed the current was going the other way, then we would say it's VA minus ES. And everything will work out fine, because if you were to do this, right, you're assuming the opposite direction, but then these terms would be flipped, so it's a, basically a double negative, all right? All right, same thing I would do for I2. The current through this inductor is simply the voltage across the inductor, which is VA, right, no data ground, divided by JXL2. And similarly for current number three, again, flowing from node A to node B, we would say that's VA minus VB to get the voltage, the net voltage across that component, divided by that component, R2. So now, I'm going to substitute these into this equation, right? So I1 happens to equal ES minus VA divided by R1 plus J XL1, and that has to equal I2, which is VA over J XL2, plus I3, which is VA minus VB, divided by R2. Now, the VA and the VB are what we're looking for. Those are our unknowns. So I'm going to rearrange this, collect up some terms and so forth, put my constants on one side of the equal side, and then my coefficients with my unknowns on the other side. So the constant we have over here is going to be ES over R1 plus JXL1. Now, VA coefficients, right? I got this negative VA R1 plus J XL1. So on this side of the equal sign, right, that's going to turn into 1 over 1 plus J XL1. And then I have this term here, 1 over J XL2. And then finally, we have another one over here, 1 over R2. Right, so all of those things are multiplied by VA. And I have one more term, which is this negative VB term. Right? Okay. Now, if you were going to solve um, something like this, you know, obviously we're going to go through and, and put the numbers in here and simplify these so that we have a single value for this and a single value for this coefficient and so on and so forth. Right? In most calculators, this um, term here would show up as a sort of a B constant. Now, this is going to be our first equation. So usually in your calculator, that shows up as B1. Okay. And then this term right here in the parentheses would be the coefficient for the first term in the first equation. So this is A11. And then this guy over here, the negative 1 over R2, this would be the coefficient for the first equation, second term, right? So if you have a simultaneous equation solution calculator, right, and I'll solve that directly, you would go into the simultaneous equation solution menu, whatever it is, um, and you would just type in these appropriate values. B1 is this, A11 is this, A12 is this, the negative 1 over R2, all right? Now, that gets me one equation. Once we put numbers in here and simplify it, I have one equation. Now I have to repeat the process over here at node B. Okay, So when I look at node B, what do I have? I'm going to do the same process all over again. Right? What's coming in? What's going out? Well, what's coming in is I3 and IS. And what's exiting? I4. Right? Basic KCL. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to do it in one step here, basically. What is I3? Again, it's VA minus VB divided by R2, this guy over here. Okay. Again, if we had assumed I3 was going this way, it would be VB minus VA. We'd have a double negative. It'll all work out. Okay. So anyway, I3, VA minus VB sitting over R2. Okay, now what is IS? Well, IS is going to turn out to be a constant, right? We know the value of the current source, so I can just put that in there. There's really nothing else I need to do. And then I just have to describe what I4 is. Well, that's going down like this, so we would say that's VB dropping across R3. 
All right, so the same thing I did over here. I want to simplify this up, get my constants on one side. So we have one constant, which is IS. All right, I have a couple of VB terms over here, right? Um, we've got a, a negative 1 over R2. Bring this over here. We've got a, a 1 over R3 term as well. And then this um, VA over R2 part, also that'll turn into a negative 1 over R2 over here. Okay, so like I said, we had the R2 and the R3. All right, so again, in your calculator, um, this term right here is going to be the B2, right, second equation, um, constant value. The negative 1 over R2 is going to be the A coefficient for second equation, first item. And then this bit right here is going to be the coefficient, second equation, second item, right? All right. Um, so we would plug the values in from the schematic, right? reduce this down, solve it. Um, you could also use, if you didn't have a calculator that would do this directly, um, you could also use something like Gauss-Jordan elimination, uh, expansion by minors, all depending on what you want to do. This is uh, basically a two by two, so um, you could also use the rule of Saris, sometimes called Kramer's rule, to solve this. Um, but once they get bigger, you know, once you start looking at uh, maybe something with four or five nodes, you can't use that rule, and you'll, you'll either have to use, if you're going to do it manually, um, Gauss-Jordan or expansion by minors, um, but however you solve it, eventually we'll come back with some values. In other words, when we solve this two unknowns, VA and VB, right, we'll have values for them, you know, whatever they work out to. Now I can take those values, bring them back into the original circuit, and having known those values, figured out those values, we could say, all right, I want to know what I2 is. Fine, well, I know what VA is. So VA divided by JXL2, that'll get me I2. Oh, I want to find out what the voltage drop across uh, this capacitor is. Well, I know IS. We can do an Ohm's law there. I want to find the voltage drop across this pair of components, right? So um, we take I1 and, um, again, use Ohm's law on this impedance R1 plus JXL1, we can find that drop, all right? And all of these things would, of course, have to work. Uh, there is a little bit of an issue, you know, if you're doing this by hand, even if you're writing the equations, you can see there are certainly a fair number of steps here. If you mess up one sign, you know, a minus sign, a plus sign, something like that, um, some ugliness can occur, obviously. You can get some values that are totally crazy. So a way to cross-check your work is to then go back, take the values for VA and VB that you computed in this example, and see if your KVL summation would work. In other words, you would know VA from this computation, right? But KVL, Kirchhoff's voltage law, would say, look, ES has to equal this drop plus this drop. All right? Now, as we said, um, you know, we can, we can figure out what this current is, okay? I have an, an ES and a, and a VA here. So if I, if I take that value, determine I1, okay, I know what this voltage is, this current, this current, and this current are going to have to balance out on my original equation. Okay, so in other words, take this current and this current. Now, does this KV, uh, KCL summation work out with this current I3? Given the VA and the VB that we've calculated, which will, given R2, tell you what I3 should be, all right? If those things work out, in other words, if, if those two sets of summations agree, then you know you've got the right values, okay? Now, there is one more thing that you can do here, which is to check your two equations. So here are your two equations. And I'll put the little coefficients in there as well. You can look for something called diagonal symmetry. All right. Now I'm going to copy this equation uh, back over here. Okay. So I've got this I S minus one over R two V A 
plus the 1 over R2 plus the 1 over R3 VB. Okay, oops, that's a B. Um, now, if I made a diagonal across here, okay, like so, your equations would have to exhibit diagonal symmetry. So what I mean by that is if you then moved diagonally across, okay, sort of, kind of, sort of perpendicular, you should have the same coefficients. All right? I don't care if this is a, a 10 by 10. This still has to work. You know, you'd have coefficients out here and, and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, why would it have to be this way? Well, because you're talking about an element over here. Um, you know, if it's the second element in the first row, it's going to have to wind up be, being the second, um, excuse me, the first element in the second row. Um, we're going to exploit this in some future work to show you a, a quick way of setting up these equations. But this is the general approach. And like I said, the convenient part is you end up with node voltages from which you can derive any other component voltages or currents that you might be interested in. Um, very broad. There's really no circuit that you can't solve using nodal analysis. So it's a really good um, uh, tool in your, in your kit box. The um, only downside I can see, besides the fact that you do have to do simultaneous equation solutions, which when they're big can be a little cumbersome, a little tedious, um, the only other downside really is that you're dealing with lots of reciprocals, okay? That you're dealing with, you know, conductances and susceptances and admittances instead of, you know, straight up resistances, um, impedances, reactances. So one little trick you can do, which um, in a larger circuit will save you some time, instead of dealing with all of these reciprocals, just immediately, first step, take all of these components and find out what the reciprocals are. In other words, for the resistor, just immediately throw in a value that's a conductance. You know, the same thing for like the, the capacitor inductor. You know, you figure out the susceptance, okay, or if it's a... Um, uh, you know, a combined thing like this. You do a, a instead of an impedance, you use uh, an admittance. And then you can just throw those in, because these things are going to be repeated. Like in this case, you know, we see this 1 over R2 occurring um, multiple places. So that'll actually save you a little time on a big circuit. Okay, uh, I think that's as good a place as any for us to call it.